Section 34 of The Book of A Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Siddharth. The Book of A Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 34. When it was the six hundred and twenty ninth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Kharib saw his brother in the clutches of the gul, he cried out, saying, O, oh, the favor of Ibrahim, the friend, the blessed one, whom Allah keep and assign, and crave his charger at Sa Adan shaking his mace till the rings loud rang then he cried out again god is most great and smote the ghul on the flat of the ribs with his mace whereupon he fell to the ground insensible and loosed his grip on sahim nor did he come to himself ere he was pinioned and shackled when his son saw this he turned and fled but Gharib drove steed after him, and smiting him with his mace between the shoulders, threw him from his horse. So they bound him with his father and brethren, and haltering them with ropes, hailed them all six along like baggage camels, till they reached the Gul's castle, which they found full of goods and treasures and things of price. And there they also came upon twelve hundred Ajamis, men of Persia, bound and shackled, Kharib sat down on Sa Adan's chair, which had aforetime belonged to Shasa, bin Shais, bin Shaddad, bin Ad, causing Sahim to stand on his right and his companions on his either hand, and sending for the gul of the mountain, said to him, How findest thou thyself, O accursed? replied Sadan, O oh my lord, in the sorriest of plights of abasement and mortification, my sons and I, we are bound with ropes like camels. Quoth Garib, It is my will, you enter my faith, the faith al-Islam, highs and acknowledge the unity of all knowledge of the all-knowing king, whose all might created light and night and everything. There is no God but He, the requiting King, and confess the mission and prophethood of Abraham, the friend, on whom be peace. So the Gul and his sons made the required profession after the goodliest fashion, and Gharib bade loose their bonds, whereupon Sa'adan wept and would have kissed his feet, he and his sons, but Gharib forbade them, and they stood with the rest who stood before him, then said Kharib, Harkye Saadan, and he replied, At thy service, O my lord, quoth Kharib, What are these captives? O my lord, quoth the Gul, These are my game from the land of the Persians, and are not the only ones. Asked Kharib, And who is with them? And Saadan answered, O my lord, there is with them the princess, Fakr Taj, daughter of King Sabur of Persia, and a hundred damsels like moons. When Garib heard this, he marveled and said, O Emir, how came ye by these? Replied Sa'adan, I went forth one night with my sons and five of my slaves in quest of booty, but finding no spoil in our way, we dispersed over wilds and birds and fared on, hoping we might happen on somewhat of prey and not written empty-handed, till we found ourselves in the land of Persians. Presently we espied a dust cloud, and sent on to reconnoitre one of our slaves, who was absent a while, and presently returned and said, O oh my lord, this is the princess Fakr Taj, daughter of Sabur, king of Persians, Turkomans and Medes. And she is on a journey, attended by two thousand horse. Quoth I, 
thou hast gladdened us with good news. We could have no finer loot than this. Then I and my sons fell upon the Persians and slew of them three hundred men and took the princess and twelve hundred cavaliers prisoners, together with all that was with her of treasure and riches, and brought them to this our castle. Quoth Garib, Hast thou offered any violence to the princess Fakartaj? Quoth Sadan, Not I, as thy head liveth, and by the virtue of the faith I have but now embraced. Garib replied, It was well done of thee, O Sa'adan, for her father is a king of the world, and doubtless he will dispatch troops in quest of her and lay waste the dwellings of those who took her. And whoso looketh not to issue, an end hath not fate to friend. But where is the damsel? said Sa'adan. I have set apart a pavilion for her and her damsels, said Kharib. Show me her lodging, whereto Sa'adan rejoined. Hearkening and obedience, so he carried him to the pavilion, and there he found the princess wound full and cast down, weeping for her former condition of dignity and delight. When Gharib saw her, he thought the moon was near him, and magnified Allah, and all hearing, the all seeing. The princess also looked at him and saw him a princely cavalier, with velour shining from between his eyes and testifying for him and not against him, so she rose and kissed his hands, then fell at his feet, saying, O hero of the age, I am under thy protection. Guard me from this gull, for I fear lest he do away with my maidenhead, and after devour me. So take me to serve thine handmaidens. Quoth Garib, Thou art safe, and thou shalt be restored to thy father and the seat of thy worship. Whereupon she prayed that he might live long and have advancement in rank and honor. Then he bade unbind the Persians and turning to the princess said to her, What brought, what brought thee forth of thy palace to the wilds and ways so that the highway robbers made prize of thee? She replied, O my lord, my father, and all the people of his realm, Turks and Dalamites, are Magians, worshipping fire, and not the all-powerful king. Now in our country is a monastery called the Monastery of the Fire, whither every year the daughters of the Magians and worshippers of the fire resort at the time of their festivals, and abide there a month, after which they return to their houses. So I and my damsel set out, as wont, attended by two thousand horse, whom my father sent with me to guard me. But by the way, the skull came out against us and slew some of us, taking the rest captive, and present us in this hold. This, then, is what befell me, O valiant champion, whom Allah guard against the shifts of time. And Gharib said, Fear not, for I will bring thee to thy palace, and the seat of thy honours. Wherefore she blessed him, and kissed his hands and feet. Then he went out from her, after having commanded to treat her with respect, and slept till morning. Then he made the wuzu ablution, and prayed a two-bow prayer, after the rite of our father Abraham, the friend, on whom be peace, Wills Nikul and his sons in Kharib's company all did the like after him. Then he turned to the gul and said to him, O Sa'adan, wilt thou not show me the Vedi of Blossoms? I will, O my lord, said he. So Kharib and his company and the princess Fakartaj and her maidens all rose and went forth, while Sa'adan commanded his slaves and slave girls to slaughter and cook and make ready the morning meal and bring it to them among the trees. For the giant had a hundred and fifty handmaids, and a thousand chattels to pasture his camels, and oxen and sheep. When they came to the valley, they found it beautiful, exceedingly, and passing all degree, and the birds on the tree, 
sang joyously, and the mocking nightingale thrilled out her melody, and the Kushat filled her moan, the mansions made by the deity, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and thirtieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Gharib and his merry men and the giant and his tribe reached the Vedi of Blossoms, they found birds flying free, the Cushat filling with her moan, the mansions made by the deity, the Bulbul singing as if it were human harmony, and the mule whom to describe tongue faileth utterly, the turtle whose playing maidens, whose plaining maddens men for love ecstasy, and the ring dove, and the popinjay answering her with fluency. There also were trees laden with all manner of fruitary of each two kinds, the pomegranate sweet and sore upon branches, growing luxuriantly the almond apricot, the camphor apricot, and the almond Khorasan heis, the plum with whose branches the boughs of the myrobalan were entwined tight, the orange as it were a cresses flaming tight, the shadow weighed down with heavy fright, the lemon that cures lack of appetite, the criton against jaundice of sovereign might, and the date, red and yellow bright, the especial handiwork of Allah, the Most High, of the like of this place, saith the enamoured poet. When its birds in the lake make melody, the lawn lover yearneth its sight to see. Tis as Eden breathing a fragrant breeze, with its shade and fruits and drills flowing free. Kharib marvelled at the beauty of that Vedi and bade them set up there the pavilion of Fagartaj, the Khosrite. So they pitched it among the trees and spread it with richer tapestries. Then he sat down and the slaves brought food and they ate sufficiently, after which quoth Kharib, Harkye, Saadan, and quoth he, at thy service, O my lord, hast thou aught of wine? asked Gharib, and Sadan answered, Yes, I have a cistern full of old wine. Said Gharib, Bring us some of it. So Sadan sent ten slaves who written with great plenty of wine, and they ate and drank, and were mirthful and merry. And Gharib bethought him of Mahdiya, and improvised these couplets. My mind are union days when ye were nigh, and flames my heart with love's consuming glove. By Allah, ne'er of will I quitted you, but shifts of time from you compelled me go. Peace and fair luck and greetings thousandfold to you from exiled lovers pining woe. They bore eating and drinking and taking their pleasure in the valley for three days, after which they returned to the castle. Then Garib called Sahim and said to him, Take a hundred horse, and go to thy father and mother and thy tribe, the Banu Kahtan, and bring them all to this place, here to pass the rest of their days, whilst I carry the princess of Persia back to her father. As for thee, O Sadan, tarry thou here with thy sons, till I return to thee. As Sadan, and why wilt thou not carry me? with thee to the land of the Persians. And Garib answered, Because thou stolest away King Sabu's daughter, and if his eye fall on thee, he will eat thy flesh and drink thy blood. When the gul heard this, he laughed a loud laugh, as it were the pealing thunder, and said, O my lord, by the life of thy head, if the Persians and Medes united against me, I would make them quaff the cup of annihilation. Quoth Garib, Tis as thou sayest, but tarry thou here in fort till I return to thee. And quoth the Ghul, I hear and I obey. Then Sahim departed with his comrades of the Banu Katan for the dwelling places of their tribe. And Garib set out with Princess Fakartaj and her company, intending for the cities of Sabur, 
king of the Persians, thus far concerning them, whereas regards King Sabur, he abode awaiting his daughter's return from the monastery of the fire, and when the and when the appointed time passed by and she came not, flames raged in his heart, whereof the oldest, wisest, and chiefest was Heis Daiden. And so he said to him, O minister, verily my daughter delayed her return, and I have no news of her, though the appointed times is past. So do thou send a courier to the monastery of fire, to learn what is come of her, hearkening and obedience, replied Dayden, and summoning the chief of the couriers, said to him, When thou forthright to the monastery. So he lost no time, and when he reached it, he asked the monks of the king's daughter, but they said, We have not seen her this year. So the courier returned to the city of Isvanir, and told the wazir, who went in to the king, and acquainted him with the message. Now when Sabur heard this, he cast his crown on the ground, tore his beard, and fell down in a trance. They sprinkled water upon him, and presently he came to himself, tearful, eyed, and heavy-hearted, and repeated the words of the poet. When I far apart at patience call, and tears, tears came to call, but patience never hears. What then, if fortune parted us so far, fortune and perfidy are peers? Then he called ten of his captains, and bade them mount with a thousand horse, and ride in different directions in quest of his daughter. So they mounted forthright, and parted each with his thousand, whilst Fakrathad's mother clad herself and her woman in black, and strewed ashes on her head, and sat weeping and lamenting. Such was their case, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying, her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and thirty-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that King Sabur sent his troops in quest of his daughter, whose mother clad herself and her woman in black. Such was their case, but as regards the strange adventures of Karib and the princess, they journeyed on ten days, and on the eleventh day appeared a dust cloud which rose to the confines of the sky, whereupon Karib called the emir of the Persians and said to him, Go learn the cause thereof. I hear and obey, replied he, and crave his charger, till he came under the cloud of dust, where he saw folk and inquired of them, quoth one of them, We are of the Banu Hattal, and are questing for plunder. Our emir is Samson bin al Jirah and we are five thousand horse. The Persians returned in haste and told their saying to Gharib, who cried out to his men of the Banu Khatan, and to the Persians, saying, Dawn your arms. They did as he bade them, and presently up came the Arabs, who were shouting, A plunder, a plunder, quoth Gharib, Allah confound you, O dogs of Arabs. Then he loosened his horse, and drove at them with the career of a right valiant knight, shouting, Allahu Akbar, ho, for the faith of Abraham, the friend on whom be peace. And there we fell between them great fight and sword fray, and the sword went round in a sway, and there was much said and say, nor did they leave fighting till fled the day and gloom came when they drew from one another way. Then Garib numbered his tribesmen, and found that five of the Banu Khatan had fallen, and three and seventy of the Persians, but of the Banu Hatal they had slain more than five hundred horse. As for Samson, he alighted, and sought nor meat nor sleep, but said, In all my life I never saw such a fighter as this youth, and on he fighteth, with the sword, and anon with the mace. But tomorrow I will go forth on champion wise and defy him to combat, of twain in the battle plain, where edge and point are fain, and I will cut off these Arabs. Now when Garib returned to his camp, 
the princess fakrtaj met him weeping and affrighted for the fear of that which had befallen and kissed his foot in the stirrup saying may thy hands never wither nor thy foes be blitter o champion of the age alhamdulillah praise to god who hath saved thee alive this day verily i am in fear for thee from yonder arabs when garib heard this he smiled in her face and heartened and comforted her saying fear not o princess did the enemy fill this wild and bold yet i would scatter them by the might of allah almighty she thanked him and prayed that he might be given the victory over his foes after which she returned to her woman and garib went to his tent where he cleansed himself of the blood of the infidels and they lay on guard through the night next morning the two hosts mounted and sought the plain where cut and thrust ruled sovereign the first to pick into the open was garib who craved his charger till he was near the infidels and cried out who is for jousting with me let no sluggard or weakling come out to me whereupon there rushed forth a giant a malachite of the lineage of the tribe of ad armed with an iron fail twenty pounds in weight and and drove at gharib saying o scum of the arabs take what cometh to thee and learn the glad tidings that thy last hour is at hand so saying he aimed a blow at gharib but he avoided it and the fail sank a cubit into the ground now the badawi was bent double with the blow so gharib smote him with his mace and clove his forehead in sunder and he fell down dead and allah hurried his soul to hell fire then gharib charged and wheeled and called for champions so there came out to him a second and third and a fourth and so on till ten had come forth to him and he slew them all when the infidels saw his form of fight and his smashing blows they hung back and forbore to far forth to him whereupon samsung looked at them and said allah never bless you i will go forth to him so he donned his battle gear and driving his charger into midfield where he fronted the foe and cried out to gharib saying fie on thee o dog of the arabs hath thy strength waxed so great that thou shouldst defy me in the open field and slaughter my men and gharib replied up and take blood revenge for the slaughter of thy braves so samson ran at gharib who awaited him with broad and pressed and heartened and they smote each other with maces till the two hosts marvelled and every eye was fixed on them then they wheeled about in the field and struck at each other two strokes but gharib avoided samson's stroke which we had broke and dealt with a buffet that beat in his breastbone and cast him to the ground stone dead whereupon all his host ran at gharib as one man and he ran at them crying god is most great help and victory for us and shame and defeat for those who misbelieve the faith of abraham the friend on whom be peace and shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and cease to say her permitted say end of section 34
whom the sight comprehended not, but he comprehended the sight. They looked at one another and said, What is this say that maketh our side muscles tremble, and weakened our resolution, and causeth the life to fail in us? Never in our lives had we aught goodlier than this saying, adding, Let us leave fighting, that we may ask its meaning. So they held their hands from the battle, and dismounted, and the elders assembled and held counsel together, seeking to go to Garib and say, Let ten of us repair to him. So they chose out ten of their best, who set out for Garib's tents. Now he and his people had alighted and returned to their camp, marvelling at the withdrawal of the infidels from the fight. But presently, lo and behold, the ten came up and seeking speech of Garib, kissed the art before him, and wished him glory and lasting life. Quoth he to them, What made you leave fighting? And quoth they, O oh, my lord, thou didst affright us with the words thou shoutest out at us. Then asked Garib, What calamity do ye worship? And they answered, We worship Wad and Suwa and Yaguz, lords of the tribe of Noah. And Garib, We serve none but Allah Almighty, maker of all things and provider of all livings. He it is, who created the heavens and art, and established the mountains, who made water to well from the stones, and the trees to grow and feed it while beasts in ward. For he is Allah, the one, the all-powerful Lord. When they heard this, their bosoms broadened to the words of unity faith, and they said, Verily, this be a Lord high and great, compassionate and compassionate adding, And what shall we say to become of the Muslims, of those which submit themselves to him? Quoth Karib, Say, There is no God but the God, and Abraham is the friend of God. So the ten made veracious profession of the veritable religion, and Karib said to them, And the sweet savour of all Islam be indeed established in your hearts. Fare ye to your tribe and expound the faith to them. And if they profess, they shall be saved. But if they refuse, we will burn them with fire. So the ten elders returned and expounded all Islam to their people and set forth to them the path of truth and creed. And they embraced the faith of submission with heart and tongue. Then they repaired on foot to Garib's tent and kissing ground between his hands, wished him honour and high rank, saying, O our Lord, we are become thy slaves, so command us with what thou wilt, for we are to thee audient and obedient, and we will never depart from thee, since Allah hath guided us into the right way at thy hands. Replied he, Allah abundantly required you, return to your dwellings and march forth, with your good and your children, and forego me to the wedding of blossoms and the castle of Sasa bin Shays, whilst I carry the princess Fakhrtaz, daughter of Sabur, king of the Persians, back to her father and return to you. Hearkening and obedience, said they, and straightforward returned to the encampment, rejoicing in al Islam, and expounded a true faith to their wives and children, who became believers. Then they struck their tents and set forth with their good and cattle for the way they are blossoms. When they came inside of the castle of Shays, Sadan and his sons sell it forth to them. But Karib had charged them, saying, If the girl of the mountain come out to you and offer to attack you, do ye call upon the name of Allah? the All-Creator, and he will leave his hostile intent and receive you hospitably. So, when he would have fallen upon them, they called aloud upon the name of Almighty Allah, and straightway he received them kindly and asked them of their case. 
they told him all that had passed between Karib and themselves. Whereupon he rejoiced in them and lodged them with him and loaded them with favours. Such was their case. But as regards Karib, he and his, escorting the princess, fared on five days' journey towards the city of his Banir, and on the sixth day they saw a dust cloud. So Garif sent to one of the Persians to learn the meaning of this, and he went and returned, swiftlier than bird in flight, saying, O oh my lord, these be a thousand horse of our comrades, whom the king had sent in quest of his daughter, Fakar Taj. When Garif heard this, he commanded his company to halt and pitch the tents. So they halted and waited till the newcomers reached them. When they went to meet them and told Taman, their captain, that the princess was with them, whereupon he went into Garib, and kissing the ground before him, inquired for her. Garib sent him to her pavilion, and he entered and kissed her hands and feet, and acquainted her with what had befallen her father and mother. She told him in return all that had betided her, and how Garib had delivered her from the girl of the mountain. And Shahrajad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased, saying how permitted say. When it was the six hundred and thirty third night, she said, It had reached me, O auspicious king, that when the king's daughter, Fakhrataj, had told Tuman all that had befallen her from the mountain girl, and how he had imprisoned her, and would have devoured her but for Garib, adding, And indeed it behoved my sire to give him the half of his reign. Tuman arose, and returned to Garib, and kissed his hands and feet, and thanked him for his good dealing, saying, With thy leave, O my lord, I'll return to his banir, and deliver our king the good news of his daughter's approach. Go replied Garib, and take of him the gift of glad tidings. So Tuman returned with all diligence to Isbanir, the cities, and entering the palace, kissed ground before the king, who said to him, What is there of new, O bringer of good news? quoth Tuman, I will not speak thee, till thou give me the gift of glad tidings. quoth the king, Tell me thy glad tidings, and I will content thee. So Tuman said, O king, I bring thee joyful intelligence of the return of Princess Fakhartaj. When Sabur heard his daughter's name, he fell down fainting, and they sprinkled rose water on him, till he recovered and cried to Tuman, Draw near to me and tell me all the good which had befallen her. So he came forward and acquainted him with all that had betided the princess. And Sabur bit hand upon hand, saying, Unhappy thou, O Fakhar Taj. And he bade gave to man ten thousand gold pieces, and conferred on him the government of Ishfahan city and its dependencies. Then he cried out to his Amirs, saying, Mount all of you, and fare we forth to meet the princess Fakhar Taj. And the chief eunuch went into the queen mother, and told her and all the harim the good news, whereat she rejoiced and gave him a robe of honour and thousand dinars. Moreover, the people of the city heard of this, and decorated the market streets and houses. Then the king and Taman took horse, and rode till they had sight of Karib, when Savur footed it, and made some steps towards Karib who also dismounted and advanced to meet him, and they embraced and saluted each other. And Sabur bent over Garib's hand and kissed it, and thanked him for his favours. They pitched their pavilions in face of each other, and Sabur went into his daughter, who rose, and embracing him, told him all that had befallen her, and how Garib had rescued her from the clutches of the gull of the mountain. Quote the king, By thy life, O princess of fair ones, I will overwhelm him with gifts. 
and called she, O oh, my papa, make him thy son-in-law, that he may be to thee a force against thy foes, for he is passing valiant. Her father replied, O oh, my daughter, knowest thou not that King Kirat Shah seeketh thee in marriage, and that he had cast a brocket, and had given an hundred thousand tenors in settlement, and he is king of Shiraj and its dependencies, and is lord of empire and horsemen and footmen. But when the princess heard these words, she said, O my papa, I desire not that whereof thou speakest, and if thou constrain me to that I have no mind to, I will slay myself. So Sabur left her and went into Karib, who rose to him, and they sat a while together. But the king could not take his fill of looking upon him, and he said in his mind, By Allah, my daughter is excusable if she loved this Badawi. Then he called for food, and they ate and passed the night together. On the morrow they took horse and rode, till they arrived at the city of Isbanir, and entered stirrup to stirrup, and it was for them a great day. Fakhr Taj repaired to her palace, and the abiding place of her rank, where her mother and her women received her with cries of joy and loud lullilowings. As for King Sabur, he sat down on his throne, and seated Gharib on his right hand, whilst the princes and chamberlains, the Amirs, Vajirs, and Nababs stood on either hand, and gave him joy of the recovery of his daughter. Said Sabur, Whoso loved me, let him bestow a robe of honour on Gharib. And there fell dresses of honour on him like drops of rain. Then Gharib abode the king's guest ten days, when he would have departed, but Sabur clad him in an honourable robe, and swore him by his fate that he should not march for a whole month. Quoth Gharib, O king, I am plighted to one of the girls of the Arabs, and I desire to go into her. Quoth the king, Whether is the fairer, thy betrothed, or Fakhr Taj? O king of the age, replied Gharib, What is the slave beside the lord? And Sabur said, Fakhr Taj is become thy handmaid, for that thou didst rescue her, from the paunches of the girl, and she shall have none other husband than thyself. Thereupon Karib rose, and kissed ground, saying, O king of the age, thou art a sovereign, and I am but a poor man, and belike thou wilt ask a heavy dowry. Replied the king, O my son, know that Kirat Shah, lord of Shiraj and dependencies thereof, seek at her in marriage, and hath appointed an hundred thousand deniers to her dower. But I have chosen thee before all men, that I may make thee the sword of my kingship, and my shield against vengeance. Then he turned to his chief officers, and said to them, Bear witness against me, O lords of mine empire, that I marry my daughter Fakhr Taj to my son Karib. And Shahrajad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and thirty-fourth night, she continued, It had reached me, auspicious king, that Sabur, king of Ajamland, said to his chief officers, Bear a witness against me that I marry my daughter Fakhr Taj to my son Karib. With that, he joined palms with him, and she became his wife. Then said Gharib, Appoint me a dower, and I will bring it to thee, for I have in the castle of Sasa wealth and treasures beyond count. Replied Sabur, O my son, I want of thee neither treasure nor wealth, and I will take nothing for her dower, save the hate of Jamakhan king of dust, and the city of Avaj. Quoth Gharib, O king of the age, I will fetch my folk forthright, and go to thy foe and spoil his realm. Quoth Sabur, Allah required thee with good, 
and dismiss the lords and commons, thinking, If Garib go forth against Jamar Khan, he will never more return. When morning morrowed, the king mounted with Garib, and bidding all his troops take horse rode forth to the plain, where he said to his men, Do ye tilt its pairs and gladden my heart. So the champions of Persia land pled one against other, and Garib said, O king of the age, I have a mind to tilt with the horsemen of Ajam land, but on one condition. Asked the king, What is that? And answered Garib, It is that I shall don a light tunic and take a headless lance with a pannon dipped in saffron, whilst the Persian champions sally fought and tilt against me with sharp spears. If any conquer me, I will render myself to him. But if I conquer him, I will mark him on the breast, and he shall leave the plain. Then the king cried to the commander of the troops to bring forward the champions of the Persians. So he chose out from amongst the princes one thousand two hundred of his stoutest champions. And the king said to them, in the Persian tongue, Whoso slept this Badavi may ask of me what he will. So they strove with one another for precedence, and charged down upon Garib, and truth was distinguished from falsehood, and jest from honest. Quote Garib, I put my trust in Allah, the God of Abraham, the friend, the deity, who had power over all, and from whom naught is hidden, the One, the Almighty, whom the sight comprehended not. Then an Amalekite-like giant of the Persian champions rushed out to him. But Garib let him not stand long before him, ere he marked him and covered his breast with saffron. And as he turned away, he smote him on the nap of the shaft of his lance, and he fell to the ground, and his pages bore him from the lists. Then a second champion came forth against him, and he overcame him, and marked him on the breast. And thus did he with a third, and a fourth, and a fifth. And there came out against him champion of the champion, till he had overcome them all, and marked them on the breast. For Almighty Allah gave him the victory over them, and they fared forth vanquish from the plain. Then the servants set food and strong wine before them, and they ate and drank, till Garib's wits were dazed by the drink. By and by he went out to obey a call of nature, and would have returned, but lost his way and entered the palace of Fakhar Taj. When she saw him, her reason fled, and she cried out to her women, saying, Go forth from me to your own places. So they withdrew, and she rose and kissed Garib's hand, saying, Welcome to my lord, who delivered me from the girl. Indeed, I am thine handmaid for ever and ever. Then she drew him to her bed and embraced him, whereupon desire was hot upon him, and he broke her seal, and lay with her till the morning. Meanwhile the king thought that he had departed, but on the morrow he went into him, and Sabu rose to him, and made him sit by his side. Then entered the tributary kings, and kissing the ground, stood ranged in rows on the right and left, and fell to talking of Garif's valour, and saying, Extolled be he, who gave him such prowess, albeit he so young in years. As they were thus engaged, behold, all espied from the palace windows, the dust of horse approaching, and the king cried out to his scouts, saying, Woe to you! Go and bring me news of yonder dust. So a cavalier took horse and riding off, returned after a while, and said, O king, we found under that dust an hundred horse belonging to an Amir, Haiz Sahim al lail Karib, hearing these words, cried out, O my lord, this is my brother, whom I had sent on an errand, and I will go forth to meet him. So saying, he mounted, with his hundred men of the Banu Katan, and a thousand Persians, and rode to meet his brother in great state. 
but greatness belongeth to God alone. When the two came up with each other, they dismounted and embraced, and Garib said to Sahim, O my brother, hast thou brought our tribe to the castle of Sasa, and the wedi of blossoms? O my brother, replied Sahim, when the perfidious dog Martha's heard that thou hadst made thee master of the stronghold belonging to the mountain girl, he was so chagrined and said, Accept thy march hands. Karib will come and carry off my daughter, Madia, without dower. So he took his daughter and his goods, and set out with his tribe for the land of Iraq, where he entered the city of Kufa, and put himself under the protection of King Azib, seeking to give him his daughter to wife. When Karib heard his brother's story, he well nigh gave up the ghost for rage, and said, By the virtue of the fate of Al-Islam, the fate of Abraham the friend, and by the supreme Lord, I will assuredly go to the land of Iraq, and fierce war upon it I will set on foot. Then they returned to the city, and going into the king, kissed ground before him. He rose to Garib, and saluted Sahim, after which the elder brother told him what had happened, and he put ten captains at his commandment. Under each one's hand, ten thousand horse of the duftiest of the Arabs and the Ajams, who equipped themselves and were ready to depart in three days. Then Garib set out and journeyed till he reached the castle of Sasa, whence the girl and his sons came forth to meet him, and dismounting, kissed his feet in the stirrups. He told them all that had passed, and the giant said, O my lord, do thou abide in this thy castle, whilst I with my sons and servants repair to Iraq, and lay west the city al Rustak, and bring to thy hand all its defenders bound in straightest bond. But Garib thanked him and said, O Sadan, we will all go. So he made him ready, and the whole body set out for Iraq, leaving a thousand horse to guard the castle. Thus far concerning them, but as regards Mardis, he arrived with his tribe in the land of Iraq, bringing with him a handsome present, and fared for Kufa city, which he entered. Then he presented himself before Ajib, and kissed the crown between his hands, and, after washing what is wished to kings, said, O my lord, I come to place myself under thy protection. And Shaharajat perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying how permit it say. End of section 35Section 36 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 36. When it was the six hundred and thirty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Mardis coming into the presence of Ajib said to him, I come to place myself under thy protection. Quoth Ajib, Tell me who hath wronged thee, that I may protect thee against him, though it were Sabur, king of the Persians, and the Turkomans and the Dalamites. Quoth Mardis, O king of the age, he who hath wronged me is none other than a youth whom I reared in my bosom. I found him in his mother's lap in a certain valley, and took her to wife. She brought me a son, whom I named Sahim Alayl, and her own son, Garib Haiz, grew up on my knees, and became a blasting thunderbolt and a lasting calamity, for he smote Al-Hamal, prince of the Banu Nabhan, and slew footmen and threw horsemen. Now I have a daughter who befitteth thee alone, and he sought her of me, so I required of him the head of the ghoul of the mountain. Wherefore he went to him, and, after engaging him in singular combat, made the master his man, and took the castle of Sasa bin Shays bin Shaddad bin Ad, wherein are the treasures of the ancients and the hordes of the moderns. Moreover, I hear that, become a Moslem, 
he goeth about summoning the folk to his faith. He is gone now to bear the princess of Persia, whom he delivered from the ghoul, back to her father, King Sabor, and will not return but with the treasures of the Persians. When Ajib heard the story of Mardis, he changed color to yellow and was in ill case and made sure of his own destruction. Then he said, O Mardis, is the youth's mother with thee or with him? And Mardis replied, She is with me in my tents. Quoth Ajib, What is her name? Quoth Mardis, Her name is Nuzra. "'Tis very she, rejoined Ajib, and sent for her to the presence. Now when she came before him, he looked on her and knew her and asked her, "'O oh, accursed, where are the two slaves I sent with thee?' And she answered, "'They slew each other on my account.' Whereupon Ajib bared his blade and smote her and cut her in twain. Then they dragged her away and cast her out. But trouble and suspicion entered Ajib's heart, and he cried, "'O oh, Mardis, give me thy daughter to wife.' He rejoined, She is one of thine handmaids. I give her to thee to wife, and I am thy slave. Said Ajib, I desire to look upon this son of an adulteress, Garib, that I may destroy him and cause him taste all manner of torments. Then he bade give Mardis to his daughter's dowry, thirty thousand dinars and a hundred pieces of silk brocaded and fringed with gold and a hundred pieces of silk-bordered stuffs and kerchiefs and golden collars. So he went forth with this mighty fine dowry, and set himself to equip Medea in all diligence. Such was their case, but as regards Garib, he fared on till he came to al Jazeera, which is the first town in al Iraq, and is a walled and fortified city, and he hard by it called a halt. When the townsfolk saw his army encamped before it, they bolted the gates and manned the walls, then went to the king of the city who was called al Damig, the Brainer, for that he used to brain the champions in the open field of fight, and told him what was come upon them. So he looked forth from the battlements of the palace, and seeing a conquering host, all of them Persians, encamped before the city, said to the citizens, O folk, what do yonder ajams want? And they replied, We know not. Now al Damig had among his officers a man called Saba al-Kifar, the desert lion, keen of wit and penetrating as he were a flame of fire. So he called him and said to him, Go to this stranger host, and find out who they be, and what they want, and return quickly. Accordingly he sped like the wind to the Persian tents, where a company of Arabs rose up and met him, saying, Who art thou, and what dost thou require? He replied, I am a messenger and an envoy from the lord of the city to your chief. So they took him and carried him through the lines of tents, pavilions, and standards, till they came to Garib's Shamiana, and told him of the mission. He bade them bring him in, and they did so whereupon he kissed ground before Garib, and wished him honour and length of days. Quoth Garib, What is thine errand? And quoth Saba al-Kifar, I am an envoy from the lord of the city of al-Jazeera, al-Damig, brother of King Kundamir, lord of the city of Kufa in the land of Iraq. When Garib heard his father's name, the tears railed from his eyes and rills, and he looked at the messenger and said, What is thy name? And he replied, My name is Saba al-Kifar, said Garib, Return to thy lord, and tell him that the commander of this host is called Garib, son of Kundamir, king of Kufa, whom his son Ajib slew, and he has come to take blood, revenge for his sire on Ajib, the perfidious hound. So Saba al-Kifar returned to the city, and in great joy kissed the ground, when al-Damig said, What is going on there, O Saba al-Kifar? He replied, O my master, the leader of yon host is thy nephew, thy brother's son and told him all. The king deemed himself in a dream, and asked the messenger, O Saba al-Kifar, is this thou tellest me true? And the desert lion answered, As thy head liveth, it is sooth. Then al Damig bade his chief officers take horse forthright, and all rode out to the camp, whence Garib came forth and met him, and they embraced and saluted each other. After which Garib carried him to his tents, and they sat down on beds of estate, al Damig rejoiced in Garib, his brother's son, and presently turning to him, said, I have also yearned to take blood revenge for thy father, but could not avail against the dog thy brother, for that his troops are many, and my troops are few. Replied Garib, O uncle, here am I come to avenge my sire, and blot out our shame, and rid the realm of Ajib. Said al Damig, O son of my brother, thou hast two blood reeks to take, that of thy father, and that of thy mother. Asked Garib, and what aileth my mother? And al Damig answered, Thy brother Ajib has slain her. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, 
and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and thirty-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Garib heard these words of his uncle al-Damig, verily thy brother Ajib hath slain her, he asked what was the cause thereof, and was told of all that had happened, especially how Mardis had married his daughter to Ajib, who was about to go into her. Thereupon Garib's reason fled from his head, and he swooned away and was nigh upon death. No sooner did he come to himself than he cried out to the troops, saying, To horse! But Aldamig said to him, O son of my brother, wait till I make ready mine affairs, and mount among my men, and fare with thee at thy stirrup. Replied Garib, I have no patience to wait. Do thou equip thy troops, and join me at Kufa. Thereupon Garib mounted with his troops, and rode till he came to the town of Babel, whose folks took fright at him. Now there was in this town a king called Jamak, under whose hand were twenty thousand horsemen, and there gathered themselves together to him from the village's other fifty thousand horse, who pitched their tents facing the city. Then Garib wrote a letter and sent it to King Jamak by messenger, who came up to the city gate and cried out, saying, I am an envoy. Whereupon the warder of the gate went in and told Jamak, who said, Bring him to me. So he led in the messenger, who, kissing the ground before the king, gave him the letter, and Jamak opened it and read its contents as follows. Praise be to Allah, Lord of the three worlds, Lord of all things, who giveth to all creatures their daily bread, and who over all things is omnipotent. These from Garib, son of King Kundamir, Lord of Iraq and Kufa, to Jamak. Immediately this letter reacheth thee. Let not thy reply be other than to break thine idols, and confess the unity of the all-knowing King, Creator of light and darkness, Creator of all things, the all-powerful, and accept thou do as I bid thee. I will make this day the blackest of thy days. Peace be on those who follow in the way of salvation, fearing the issues of fornication, and obey the hest of the Most High King, Lord of this world and the next, him who saith to a thing, Be, and it becometh. Now when Jamak read this letter, his eyes paled and his color failed, and he cried out to the messenger, Go to thy Lord and say to him, Tomorrow at daybreak there shall be fight and conflict, and it shall appear who is the conquering hero. So he returned and told Garib, who bade his men make ready for battle, whilst Jamak commanded his tents to be pitched in face of Garib's camp, and his troops poured forth like the surging sea and passed the night with intention of slaughter. As soon as dawned the day, the two hosts mounted and drew up in battle array and beat their drums amain and drave their steeds of swiftest strain, and they filled the whole earthly plain and the champions to come out were fain. Now the first who sallied forth a championing to the field was the ghoul of the mountain, bearing on shoulder a terrible tree, and he cried out between the two hosts, saying, I am Sadan the ghoul. Who is for fighting? Who is for jousting? Let no sluggard come forth to me, nor weakling. And he called out to his son, saying, Woe to you! Bring me fuel and fire, for I am unhungered. So they cried upon their slaves, who brought firewood and kindled a fire in the heart of the plain. Then there came out to him a man of the Kafirs, an Amalekite of the unbelieving Amalekites, bearing on his shoulder a mace like the mast of a ship, and drove at Sidon the ghoul, saying, Woe to thee, O Sidon! When the giant heard this, he waxed furious beyond measure, and raising his tree-club aimed at the infidel a blow that hummed through the air. The Amalekite met the stroke with his mace, but the tree beat down his guard and descending with its own weight, together with the weight of the mace upon his head, beat in his brain-pan, and he fell like a long-stemmed palm-tree. Thereupon Sidon cried to his slaves, saying, Take this fatted calf and roast him quickly. So they hastened to skin the infidel, and roasted him and brought him to the ghoul, who ate his flesh and crunched his bones. Now when the Kafirs saw how Sidon did with their fellow, their hair and pile stood on end, their skins quaked, their color changed, their hearts died within them, and they said to one another, Whoso goeth out against the school, he eateth him, and cracketh his bones, and causeth him to lack the zephyr wind of the world. Wherefore they held their hands, quailing for fear of the ghoul and his sons, and turned to fly, making for the town. But Garib cried out to his troops, saying, Up and after the runaways! So the Persians and the Arabs crave after the king of Babel and his host, and cause sword to smite them, till they slew of them twenty thousand or more. Then the fugitives crowded together in the city gate, and they killed of them much people, and they could not avail to shut the gate. 
So the Arabs and the Persians entered with them, fighting, and Sedan, snatching a mace from one of the slain, wielded it in the enemy's face and gained the city race course. Thence he fought his way through the foe and broke into the king's palace, where he met with Jamak, and so smote him with the mace that he toppled senseless to the ground. Then he fell upon those who were in the palace and pounded them into pieces, till all that were left cried out, Quarter! Quarter! And Sedan said to them, Pinion your king! And Shahrazad saw the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 36 End of the book A Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous Translated by Richard Francis Burton